Gretchen. Oh, sorry, I was distracted. We as human beings are so easily distracted. Do you know what I mean? There are so many things going on in our world today that scream for our attention every day. First off, there's work, emails, projects, deadlines, phone calls to be made, things to be sent in the mail, meetings, and other things. And that's just work. Then we have family responsibilities like cooking dinner, cleaning, driving the kids to sports practices, dance rehearsals, music lessons, and other activities, washing and folding the laundry, and doctor's appointments. Then we all have our own hobbies, our friendships, and other things that we enjoy. Plus we have cell phones, tablets, social media, TV shows and movies. And this is just during an ordinary week of our lives. During the holidays, we feel like we need to do all these extra things. Decorating, baking cookies, getting Santa pictures, buying the perfect gifts, wrapping those gifts, going to parties, church, activities, and other events. When you add in the holidays, you may just want to explode. It's no wonder we're so distracted. It's hard to focus. It's a fight to focus. Hi, my name is Gretchen Williams and I'm on staff here at Sycamore Creek. And I'm also a member of the teaching team. And boy, can I relate to the issue of distractions all vying for my attention every day. I recently read an article from Psychology Today by David Rock of the Neuro Leadership Institute. He says, people everywhere seem to be experiencing an epidemic of overwhelm at work. I believe it's a function of two things. Firstly, it's the amount of information we now process, which our brain may not be used to. I read somewhere that the New York Times on Sunday contains more information than the average 18th century French nobleman learned in his lifetime. Now, if only I could remember where I read that. With all of this noise in our lives, it's no wonder we're distracted. The word distract has a few different meanings. First, it means to draw away or divert, to pull our focus away from something. Like when you hear your child say, mom, 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 or that dinging of your phone that tries to draw us away from whatever it is you're trying to give your focus to, it can also be to disturb or trouble greatly in the mind. Like when you hear bad news and are so flooded by that news that you can no longer even remember what it was you were doing. It makes me think of a magician. A magician's goal is to get you to focus on one thing so you do not realize something else that is happening behind the curtain or behind their back so that when the magic is revealed, it seems amazing. So that brings me to a question you can discuss with your neighbor, your spouse, or whoever you may be with. What in your life is the biggest distraction? I'd love to hear your answers, so please feel free to write your answers in the comments. I asked this question to my friends on Facebook, and here are some of the answers I got. My phone, Facebook, ADHD, email, texts, chores, and depression. My uncle even said, my wife is my biggest distraction. I can relate to many of these distractions and more. I almost always feel like there's something else I should be doing or something else I should be giving my attention to. I'd like to believe that I'm a good multitasker. In the evening when I'm relaxing and watching TV, I often try to do something else while I'm doing that like scrolling through Facebook, working on my laptop, or playing games on my phone. But I've noticed recently that I end up having to rewind whatever show I'm watching because when I focus back on the show, I have no idea what's going on. I think we're all more distracted than we'd like to think. Here is why distractions are so important. Your spiritual enemy and every force of hell is trying to distract you from living for the things that matter most. The devil wants to draw you away from what is most important in your life, to divert your attention somewhere else. He wants to disturb your mind, discourage your soul, and disengage your faith. Craig Groeschel, pastor of Life Church, says, The devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. He doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. With enough distraction, he can neutralize you, and you'll end up destroying yourself. Knowing that, I think these distractions are something we need to get a handle on. It's easy to tell ourselves that these distractions are 
no big deal. But I don't want to live life for anything other than what matters most to myself and to God. So let's turn to scripture to see how God can help us get a handle on these distractions that would try to destroy us. Let's look at a story in the Gospel of Luke that is about two sisters, one named Mary and the other who is named Martha. Beginning in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now I need to be totally honest here. Most of my life, I have been a lot like Mary. I didn't want to be bothered by the cooking, cleaning, or preparation that were required to have guests over. I always wanted to be the one who just showed up, ate food, and had a good time. And maybe even bring some Tupperware so I could take some leftovers home for the next day. Now that may be because I'm the youngest of five children. But now that I'm an adult and quite often the one who has to make the preparations for having guests over, I feel extremely overwhelmed and end up having no fun at all when the time comes for the guests to arrive. Now that I've been there, I have a whole new perspective on Martha. I used to think, man, Martha just needs to chill out. But now I get it. If Jesus were coming to my house, I would be full of anxiety, running around, cleaning, trying to cook something delicious and beautiful for him to eat, trying to make sure that there are many different beverages for him to choose from, only name brand, of course, because that's the best, yelling for people to clean the bathrooms and sweep the floors and put your stuff away. As an adult and a mom, I'm realizing that if we didn't have people like Martha in our families, the bills wouldn't be paid, we wouldn't have anything to eat, and we'd have no Christmas presents. Do you have a Mary in your family? Do you ever feel like saying to Jesus, that no good lazy brother or sister of mine has left me with all the work? If you don't think you have one in your family, it may be you. I bet that many of you can relate to Martha when she says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But what does the scripture say about Martha? It says she was what? She was distracted. Let's see how Jesus responded to her. He said, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus said to Martha, you are worried and upset about so many things. Now I think it's important to note here what he did not say. He did not say, Martha, the things you are doing are bad, or the things you are worried about are not all that important. But rather he says that few things are truly needed and that what Mary had chosen was better. Do you ever feel that way? At the end of a get together, do you ever feel like, geez, I made such a big fuss and tried to do all these things and in the end, they really weren't important. This happens to me a lot as a parent. When celebrating my children's birthdays, I always wanna do everything. The cake, the tableware, balloons, the decorations, games and goodie bags, all in whatever theme my child has chosen. I want to throw them a Pinterest-worthy birthday party. But I almost always find that in the end, I just don't have time to do it all. In reality, the kids don't remember if I didn't put up the decorations or if I got plain plates instead of plates with Spider-Man on them. They just remember that I had a party for them and made them feel special. So often the most difficult choices aren't between what's good and bad, but between what's good and what's best. Have you ever had to decide between something that's good and something that's better? Like candy is good, but a cupcake is better. Or ice cream is good, but a hot fudge sundae is better. When was a time you had to choose between something good and something better? Let's take a few minutes to discuss that.
That was a great discussion. But it leaves me wondering, how do we differentiate between what is good and what is best? With all the distractions in our lives, it can be a real challenge to figure out if something is good or if it is the best choice to make. How do we, with God's help, choose what is best? Today I want to give you three ways to choose what is best. First, we're going to diminish the distractions. If distractions are what keep us from choosing what is best, then we want to do the best we can to diminish the things that distract us. Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians, I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. Paul is encouraging the people of Corinth to focus on the things they have within them to help them serve God the best. The one answer I heard over and over from my friends about their biggest distractions was their phones. I believe that cell phones are probably one of the biggest distractions we have in the 21st century. People lived and survived for thousands of years without cell phones. But these days we struggle when we're separated from our phones for even five minutes. A survey done of 2000 people found that one in 10 of those people checked their phones on average every four minutes, every four minutes. And one of the main things that people do with their phones is to use social media. The average American spends around two hours per day on social media. We spend so much of our time worrying about whether or not people comment on our Facebook posts or like our photos on Instagram, scrolling, tapping, staring at a screen, and wondering why our own lives aren't as good as someone else's highlight reel. Back in 2018, my friend and coworker Carola, who is on staff here at Sycamore Creek, did something that I thought was completely radical and crazy. She deleted the Facebook app off of her phone. I remember thinking, there is no way that I could ever do that. That's nice for her, but I don't think that would work for me. I recently asked her about why she did that and what the experience was like. She told me that she felt like her interactions on social media were increasingly shallow and that she was overwhelmed by the amount of negative content she was seeing. But what she gained from this one decision she made was invaluable. Social media can be really problematic for anyone, but especially for people who struggle with mental illness. Carola said, I began to go to bed at a more reasonable time. I called people more. I was less overwhelmed by the problems of the world. Don't get me wrong, the problems of the world are still very much real, but I am able to focus on what I can maybe do about it rather than getting overwhelmed by the sheer amount of things that are pushed through constantly. Carola found so many new and beautiful things by deleting one app off her phone. She told me that she stopped comparing herself to others, that she feels that she has grown closer to God and has been able to cultivate deeper, more meaningful relationships with people because she spends more time in face-to-face -face conversations. I think of what she did often. And though I thought it was crazy at first, the more I think about it and watch her grow, I wonder if it is something I could do and if I should do it. If you ever find yourself wondering why you're not as productive, why your relationships are not as intimate as they could be, or why you're not as close to God, it may be because you spend a significant amount of time staring at a little black box with a screen. While preparing for this message, I found out that there's a feature on most Apple devices that will track how much time you spend on your device. So I decided to turn it on to see what results I might get. And I've got to tell you, the results were disturbing. Now phones aren't in and of themselves bad. Phones do a lot of good things. They help keep our schedules. They help us connect with our loved ones. And they help us when we need directions to somewhere we've never been before. But perhaps we may want to reconsider how much time we spend on these little devices. In his message about distractions, Craig Groeschel said something that will stick with me for a very long time. He said, my life is too valuable, my calling too great, and my God too good to waste my life distracted by things that do not matter. My life is too valuable, my calling too great, and my God too good to waste my life distracted by things that do not matter. 
Diminishing distractions isn't about sucking the fun out of life or placing restrictions on our lives, as Paul said in the scripture I read earlier. This is about using our God-given passions, gifts, and callings to do what matters most. I want you to think about this quote anytime you're unsure if something you want to do is the best choice for you. Jesus said to Martha, you're worried and upset about so many things, but few things really matter. So we want to treat distractions like we would something that tempts us. We want to distance ourselves from distractions. That may mean putting our phones on airplane mode or turning them off when we need to focus on something really important. Or maybe even leaving our phones at home. <gasps> I have left my phone at home many times accidentally. And though it causes me quite a bit of anxiety, I have found that not only do I survive, shocking, I know, but I'm also more present in the moment and have such a great time with whatever I'm doing. Perhaps distancing yourself from distractions for you looks like deleting distracting apps like Facebook or a game. Maybe for you it means you need to turn off notifications on your phone. It may even mean you need to distance yourself from people that are distracting to you. To choose what is best, we need to diminish the distractions. The second way to choose what is best is to focus on what's important. The author of Proverbs says, Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. To help us choose what is best, rather than just what is good, we need to set our gaze ahead. Fix our eyes on Jesus. This reminds me of when we learned how to ride our bike as a kid. When you first learn to ride your bike, it's hard not to look down at your feet, watching yourself pedal. But you quickly learn that even though it may be scary, you have to fix your gaze forward to where you're going to help keep yourself balanced. Peter also learned this lesson when he saw Jesus walking on water. He called out to Jesus, and Jesus told him to step out of the boat and come to him. And so long as Peter kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, he could walk on water. But as soon as he looked down, he began to sink. Remember how I talked about my temptation to go overboard on my kids' birthdays? I want to tell you about my daughter Hope's birthday this year. Her birthday is in August, which means it's a great time to invite our friends and loved ones over to celebrate and be together. This past August, Hope had a special theme in mind from one of her favorite movies. So I bought lots of decorations, and I cooked food, and I got things for goodie bags. Hosting people in my home is not one of my strengths because I do not tend to be the most organized person. When party time came, I just wasn't ready. I hadn't put up the decorations yet, I hadn't set out the food, and I hadn't even wrapped her presents. I was so frustrated and upset about the fact that things weren't ready for the party, I kept on apologizing to our friends, and I remember so specifically them telling me, it's okay, it doesn't matter if there are decorations. How can we help you set out the food? Why don't you sit down? Hope won't remember that you didn't wrap the presents nicely. Once they said that, I realized I was so busy focusing on the preparations that I wasn't focusing on what was really important, being present with these people who I loved and who love me, and celebrating another year of my daughter's life. The distractions of throwing a picture-perfect, Pinterest-worthy birthday party was keeping me from what was better, spending quality time with the important people in my life. Have you ever experienced something like that? When was a time that you realized that distractions were stopping you from focusing on something important? Tell us about it. I'd love to hear your stories. You can write your responses in the comments or share with someone next to you. Distractions often keep us from focusing on what is really important. And it is especially tempting at Christmas time to focus on all the distractions around us rather than what really matters at Christmas. We wanna make sure we have all the decorations, bake cookies, go to all the events and activities, buy everyone the perfect gift, build a gingerbread house, go visit Santa, and whatever other traditions we may have. And we forget what Christmas is really all about. I love the Charlie Brown Christmas movie, 
when Charlie Brown asks if someone could tell him what Christmas is really all about. And Linus knows exactly what to tell him. He says, And there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Just as Linus helped Charlie Brown bring his focus back to what Christmas is all about, Jesus reminded Martha that spending time with him is more important than what she was worried about. He said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about so many things, but few things are needed. Few things really matter. To choose what is best, we have to focus on what's important. The third way to choose what is best for you is to listen to the voice of God. This scripture from the book written by the prophet Isaiah has really beautiful imagery. Listen as I read. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. If you will listen, God will speak to you. Can you imagine hearing the voice right behind you telling you, wait, hold on, that is good. But if you go left, there's something so much better. God is a speaking God. How did this world come to be? He spoke it into being. When you seek God first, you will hear him speak to you. If you open up your Bible and study his word, he will speak to you through his word. He could speak to you through other people. He may speak to you through a message or a song or your circumstances. If you have ears to hear, that voice behind you will guide you. It will say, choose this, walk this way, be a blessing to this person, give something, stop and listen to this person, take a moment to pray, stop what you're doing. Your life is too valuable, your calling is too great, and your God is too good to be distracted by things that do not last. When you listen to his voice, he will redirect you and show you what is most important. He will lead you toward what is best over what is just good. In the past couple of years, I have developed a friendship that has completely changed my life. In the midst of a major life transition, I have grown very close to my friends Star and David Lalone. They have sat in their kitchen listening to me when I was upset, shared meals with myself and my family, shared laughter with me, and spent so much quality time with me. In this time, I have learned so much from them, and I have experienced God speaking to me through them. I have discovered that sometimes I can be a bit uptight about letting my kids do things because I just don't want to have to deal with the mess that may come after, or I don't want to have to take the extra time something might take if I let the kids help me with something, or I think something may be too hard to do with them by myself. But I have observed Star be a yes mom, when her girls want to help her cook, she lets them pull up a stool and help. When they want to paint a picture, she gets out the paper and paint so they can paint. If they want to play outside and get a little dirty, she knows that they can wash their hands when they're done. And I've begun to hear God speaking to me through the lessons I've learned from her. He has said to me, it's okay if they mix the Play-Doh colors and make a mess. Yes, the cookies will take longer if they help, but they will remember this time with you when they're grown up. Why can't they do the face masks with you? It will be okay and it will be fun. Someday you will miss them wanting to do these things with you. You'll wish they would ask you if they could help or if they can do something with you. You'll miss baking and their Play-Doh creations. The memories that I have made and the quality time I have spent with my kids 
since I have begun to learn these lessons through my friendship with Star are invaluable. If we will just slow ourselves down, diminish the distractions, focus on what is important, and listen for God's voice, we will begin to live not for what is good, but what is best. It is my prayer that here at Sycamore Creek, we would begin to discover the areas where we need to focus on what is best. And I can only imagine the way that our church, our community, and our world would be changed when we are all living for the things that really matter. As we close, I'd like to challenge you to consider what distractions God may be telling you that you need to let go of today. Ask him to show you what you may need to let go of and make a plan to begin to let go of that distraction.